Good morning and welcome everyone to the um, Environmental Protection Commission meeting. I'm going to ask everyone to mute their phones. If everyone would mute their devices unless they're speaking, um, I'll just remind you of that as we go, I'm sure. And let's start today's meeting with a Pledge of Allegiance. You'll see a image of the American flag on your screens momentarily. Please rise and pledge the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing as I give the invocation in the absence of our uh, chaplain today. Let us pray today for gratitude for our natural resources. Let us pray for the wisdom and strength to be good stewards of our environment. This week, our community lost a wise and bold champion of our environment when Sierra Club Chair Kent Bailey passed away on Tuesday. He was a dear friend of mine, and I know several of the EPC staff and board members here today will personally miss his friendship as well. We will be organizing a formal celebration of his life for our next EPC meeting, and there will be other memorials for this great man. For today, let us consider how we can each carry on his legacy of environmental protection. Let us pray that his family finds comfort in the knowledge that Kent was greatly respected and dearly loved throughout our community, and he will be deeply missed. And let us simply hold him in our hearts for a moment of silence before we begin our meeting. Thank you. Let's be seated. And before we call the roll, I'll read a memo from Commissioner Miller. He says, please be advised that due to a scheduling conflict, I'm unable to attend the Thursday, September 24th, 2020 EPC meeting. Please read the re reason for my absence into the record. And so at this time, staff will call the roll for attendance. Good morning, Smith. Here. Hagen. Here. Kemp. Commissioner Kemp. Here. Miller is absent. Merman. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Merman's here. Thank you. Overman? Here. White? Thank you. You have a quorum? Thank you. Um, so um, it, we'll turn to Ms. Doherty for um, any uh, changes to the agenda. Commissioner, there are no changes to the agenda. Thank you. And we have, um, we have no recognitions and proclamations today um, and I'm advised we have no public comment is that correct ma'am that is correct so that takes us right to the consent agenda do I have a motion second Commissioner Merman thank you we have a motion to approve by Commissioner Merman second by Commissioner Overman uh, staff to call the roll call vote Smith? Yes. Hagen? Yes. Kemp? Yes. Merman? Yes. Overman? Yes. White? Motion carried five to zero. Thank you. 
And that takes us to the regular agenda. Ms. Doherty, will you uh, take us through the presentations? Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Uh, today we have two presentations, and I'm going to introduce you Shang Bustani, who is our Director of Waste. Uh, the first presentation will be on the MacDill Air Force Base and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Partnership. And the second one will be a Brownsfield update, a Brownsfield program update. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Shang Bustani to introduce our presenters. Thank you, Janet. Good morning, commissioners. I'm Hushang Bustani, EPC staff. As Janet said, the, the presentation, the first presentation, I know Air Force Base. But before I introduce our speaker, I'd like to give you some background in the to totality of, of restoration work at McDill. At McDill, the Air Force <clears throat> has been pursuing environmental restoration work in accordance with the Defense Department's environmental restoration program. It involves activities and cleanup of sites that are contaminated through investigative and remedial work. Under this program, there is a community-based advisory board that has been established known as the Restoration Advisory Board, or RAB, R-A-B. Today, I'm pleased to announce that several members of that board are present virtually, including the chair of the advisory board, Mr. Robert Wynn, who's the director of McDill's Civil Engineer Squadron. He will be making a few comments shortly. <clears throat> the second part of the restoration work at McDill is based on a partnership with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services which provides on behalf of the Air Force natural resource restoration and management work. And the focus of the presentation that you will see today is on this part of the work, which Mr. Brandon Meyer will be providing to you. At this time, I would like to ask whether, I'm not sure if he's on right now. Uh, Todd, are you in? Hushang, yes, this is Todd Wynn here. I uh, appreciate that. And, Todd, and as I said, is the chair of the advisory board. So uh, I've asked him to make a few comments about the the RAB. Go ahead, Todd. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, to meet with you all today. Um, I believe that uh, McDill Air Force Base uh, has a great history, as Hushang mentioned, of cooperation. Um, with the local community, especially when you look at the uh, the restoration side of what we do. Uh, Hushang uh, touched on it a little bit. As the director of the Civil Engineer Squadron here, I am responsible for all environmental actions on the installation, including you know our stewardship of the natural and cultural resources we have here as well, and any compliance issues that we have, as well as uh, waste management, uh, hazardous waste management, hazardous material management, so on and so forth. So. Um, we, we are very proud to, uh, to kind of lean forward in that area and have a great relation, the great relationship we do. But as he mentioned, I, part of my uh, job is to be the co-chair of the Restoration Advisory Board here in the local area. I actually co-chair that um, with uh, Mr. Marty Allen, who had just uh, coincidentally passed away last week. So we will be getting a, a new co-chair for the, for the community for that. But that's a, that's a great opportunity for us to meet semi-annually talk about where we are with our restoration process. It's been a long process, as you probably aware, but, and to kind of, kind of give an update on that and make sure that we're all in sync on that. But don't want to belabor that much. Just uh, appreciate the opportunity to say hi. Uh, another thing I'd add is um, we have a great uh, individual that's embedded with us from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that you're going to be hearing from here in a minute, Br Mr. Brendan Myers. So I'm excited to hear from him. I know he's doing great things for us here at the installation, and I think you'll be impressed as well. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Todd. <clears throat> so now I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker. His name is 
Brandon Myers. He works for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. He's a graduate of our own USF in biology. He has more than a decade of experience in, in, the, in the field of natural resource management and restoration uh, in Florida, in military bases in Florida. He has worked for several organizations, including uh, the Nature Conservancy, Colorado, Colorado State University, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife. In his free time, he likes to enjoy exploring Florida's public land and spend time with his wife and his less than a year old boy. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Brandon Myers. Thank you, Mr. Bushani. Uh, just making sure that everybody can hear me, if I can get a nod or a, or a yes. Uh, we hear you and we see your presentation. We can hear. Fantastic, sounds good, thank you very much. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen of the Hillsborough EPC. Thank you for allowing me to speak at your meeting this morning. As Mr. Bushani said, my name is Brendan Myers and I currently serve as a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service liaison at McDill Air Force Base. I'm gonna speak with you this morning about the Air Force U.S. Fish Service Partnership in Florida, how that ties into natural resource management at McDill, and the overall natural resource management at McDill. Please feel free at any time uh, during the presentation to ask questions, or you can save them for the end if there are any. Um, this presentation can also be provided upon request after the meeting for future reference. So to begin, I've provided both the Air Force and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service missions um, both of these missions coincide in several places throughout the state of Florida. Many Air Force installations need to actively manage their resources to continue to provide a sustainable and realistic military training environment and stay within a myriad of natural resource regulations. This can be accomplished through an ecosystem management approach that helps conserve fish, wildlife, and plants and their associated habitats. Air Force installations are under regulations per the Sykes Act, and the Endangered Species Act, where applicable, and routinely work with the service to maintain compliance with these regulations. The quote you see down here at the bottom is from the Florida Strategic Plan for Sustaining Military Readiness Through Conservation Partnerships, published in May 2016. And I think it subsequently combines both agencies' missions into one single statement. Um, I'll refer to this plan several times throughout the presentation, and just for brevity, I'm just going to call it the Florida Strategic Plan. So here's an image from the Florida Strategic Plan. There are eight Air Force installations throughout Florida, with the majority being located along the state's coastlines, with the exception being Avon Park Air Force Range in central Florida, located along the Lake Wells Ridge, located here where my cursor is. There are several other military installations and the assets located throughout the state that are not discussed in the Florida Strategic Plan, and that includes naval installations and other military assets. I'm sure that we're all familiar with this location, but just to be sure, here is a, uh, the location of, of McDill Air Force Base on the southern end of the Inner Bay Peninsula, um, and it is one of seven located along the coastline of Florida. The Air Force and U.S. Fish Service Partnership started out of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Bureau Beach Field Office with the stationing of a consultation biologist at Avon Park Air Force Range. This position proved to be successful and is still stationed at Avon Park, but is now referred to as the liaison. In 2016, the Florida Strategic Plan was published. Work had continued between 2010 and 2016 to expand the program with great interest in it from the Florida Panhandle out of the Panama City Field Office due to the three installations located in the Florida Panhandle. And that's Hurlburt Field, Eglin Air Force Base, and Tyndall Air Force Base. In 2018, several positions were hired at other Air Force installations throughout the state, including McDill Air Force Base. Several of these installations already had U.S. Fish and Wildlife personnel performing a myriad of threatened and endangered species work and data collection. 
So again, here's the picture from the Florida strategic plan, just to refresh our memory of the location of the installations. And here are the Air Force installations that currently have U.S. Fish and Wildlife employees working on a myriad of natural resource projects. So different Air Force installations need different functions performed by the service employees, depending on the listed species and the individual installation needs. These range from data collection of threatened and endangered species, such as sea turtles and Florida scrub jays at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, to several types of freshwater mussels at Eglin Air Force Base in the Panhandle. Service members also assist with conservation planning with the installation's Integrated Natural Resource Management Plan, or INRAM. The blue asterisks that you can see on this slide indicate several of the functions that the liaison performs at MacDill Air Force Base. Now, please note that this is not an all-inclusive list, but highlights some of the main areas that the service assists MacDill Air Force Base. Now let's start to dig down and focus on how the partnership functions at MacDill. Here is just a general aerial of MacDill Air Force Base with the base boundary highlighted in yellow. The large natural resource areas at MacDill are the mangrove forests located on the southern side of the base, the pine flatwoods and recreational areas located on the southeastern portion of the base, and the mangrove forest, pine flatwoods, and wetlands located on the western and northwestern side of the base. Overall at MacDill, there are over 1,500 acres of land managed as natural areas on the base. The MacDill airfield, which is shown here in the center with the runway, is over 1,000 acres and is a mowed bahia grass field with a, net, with a network of drainage ditches. If we keep looking at this image, we can also see some of the natural resource issues that the base faces. These include encroachment from new developments along the northern boundary of the installation, base developments, and military infrastructure construction against forested ecosystems in the south, creating wildland urban interface, or WUI. And we can see that here. So here is a timeline of U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service assistance at MacDill. This just covers the last approximately five years. In 2016, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service National Fishery at Wallaca, located just east of Gainesville, began a project at MacDill to treat aquatic invasive plant species within several natural areas restored and enhanced by swim projects. This project is ongoing and helps to keep several areas of the base open for consumptive and non-consumptive recreational opportunities such as fishing, kayaking, canoeing, biking, disc golf, and wildlife viewing. The MacDill Air Force Base liaison position was filled in late 2018 and is remotely based out of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Panama City Field Office, but is provided permanent office space at MacDill Air Force Base. This position handles technical assistance for proposed federal actions at MacDill, and Section 7 consultations for proposed projects that have a potential effect on Endangered Species Act listed species. These consultations are run through the North Florida Field Office out of Jacksonville. The member also assists with contract oversight, threatening endangered species data collection, and public outreach. These functions have helped to increase the efficiency of Section 7 consultations for the base, increase the number of, quote, eyes on the ground, for monitoring threatened and endangered species occurring at MacDill, and assist in, with monitoring and implementation of the habitat restoration projects. So here's an aerial image of the state of Florida that shows some of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service assets, national wildlife refuges, and fisheries. All of these could be available to assist in a myriad of natural resource functions and projects at MacDill. This is one of the stronger aspects of the Air Force U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service partnership, being able to contact and bring in additional service resources when needed. Here we can see the red circles that show all of the service assets that have assisted the base over the past two years through Endangered Species Act Section 7 consultations or technical assistance, implementation of natural resource projects, sharing 
of equipment or personnel resources, prescribed fire assistance, and invasive species management. This includes service personnel at other military installations, such as Avon Park Air Force Range, Tyndall Air Force Base, and Hurlburt Field, national fisheries, such as Wallaca, ecological service field offices, such as Jacksonville, otherwise known as the North Florida Field Office, and a myriad of national wildlife refuges. Please note, though, that not all refuges or fisheries are shown within the aerial due to either a lack of personnel or equipment available for assistance, or due to travel distance from McDill. It would be kind of hard to bring some equipment up from, let's say, Big Pine Key to McDill in a timely manner. Some of the icons also consolidate several different asset locations, such as wildlife refuges located in the Florida Keys and South Florida. So here are some of the federal t and &E species that the base thinks about and factors into its natural resource management. Some of these species can be found year round, such as the wood sork and bald eagle. Some of these are migrant species, such as piping plover and red knots. And some have the possibility of being found around the waters of the base, such as the small tooth sawfish on the bottom left, the Florida manatee, and the giant manta ray in the bottom center. The gopher tortoise pictured in the top right is a federal candidate species in the eastern portion of its population. And the Air Force has signed on to a candidate conservation agreement to help mitigate the impacts to the species and their habitats, which helps to reduce the possibility of future listing under the Endangered Species Act. There are currently no federal endangered plant species known to occur at McDill Air Force Base. Here's another overview of the base itself. And this map shows the overall t and &E monitoring or threatened and endangered species monitoring and sightings at Medill. Now, <laughs> please note that this is only accurate through February of this calendar year due to COVID-19 travel and teleworking restrictions that have been placed on both Air Force and U.S. Fish staff. I've also purposefully obscured what the individual points are for, but they cover gopher tortoise sightings, burrows, wood stork sightings, red knot and piping plover sightings, manatee sightings, sea turtle sightings, and several other state listed species. There has not been a confirmed sighting of an eastern indigo snake on base in several, several decades, but the base still enters into Endangered Species Act Section 7 consultations regarding this species due to a very long ago past sighting and the potential for their presence due to the current presence of gopher tortoise burrows in their habitat. There are, of course, some challenges with the partnership, as there are with all conservation partnerships. The small amount of dedicated natural resource personnel at McDill is a challenge at times. We're all pulled in several different directions at once, especially this year, and the base personnel are no different. They wear multiple hats all at the same time. Cooperative agreements have been a vital aspect of natural resource management at McDill in the past several decades. Implementation of future cooperative agreements between the service and McDill Air Force Base will be a challenge, but possible with diligent work from all sides. A vital part of natural resource management at McDill and in the Air Force partnership as a whole is to maintain relationships with local, state, regional, federal, and nonprofit partners throughout the region. The new liaison at McDill had the difficulties of starting new relationships and continuing old relationships that had been cultivated and maintained by base personnel for several years and decades. Another recent challenge, uh, the last bullet, is COVID-19. I think by the lack of a in-person presentation right now, we can all see the challenges that have been placed upon the Air Force partnership by the current global pandemic. Both Air Force and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service staff have worked diligently over the last six months to ensure that there have been no interruptions in regulatory processes or natural resource project oversight or implementation. This mainly includes moving meetings and communications to a mostly digital interface and implementing strict CDC and agency-specific guidelines when face-to-face -face or fieldwork meetings are needed. So the final part of this presentation will focus on natural resources at McDill overall and present some challenges that the base will potentially deal with in the future. 
This slide here shows that MacDill has considered some conservation and natural resource management goals and the proposed timelines for their completion. Please note that these are not exact timeframes and many of them depend on continued or additional funding sources. I'll quickly go through these goals and then expand on them in the next few slides. To start at the top, a long-term goal is to maintain and increase the population of gopher tortoise located at MacDill. This population is completely cut off from any other population in the region. And the base hopes to achieve this goal through habitat restoration, including the removal of invasive plant species within upland areas, installation of native plant species within those treated areas, and increasing the amount and frequency of prescribed fire throughout the base's natural areas. A midterm goal is to continue restoring the historic hydrology along the base's southern shoreline. The historic hydrology was disrupted throughout the 20th century, and the base has implemented several projects within this area in the past decade. A short-term goal is to implement and reintroduce a more robust and mimic a more historic prescribed fire regime. The base has already begun to implement this goal with the help of the Air Force Wild and Fire module based out of Avon Park Air Force Range. To continue on that short-term goal, here is an overall picture of all the prescribed fires at MacDill over the past five years. Now, this might not appear to be impressive to some other conservation lands, but when looked at through the, through the lens of operational constraints, it is quite an achievement. MacDill has several hundred acres of vulnerable natural areas and has had a spotty prescribed fire implementation since the 1990s. Fire is an important aspect of habitat restoration and natural resource management, especially in ecosystems that have adapted with a hyperpyrogenic environment, such as pine flatwoods. Pine flatwoods can be found in several areas on the base and serve an important function of sustaining a small population of gopher tortoise. Implementing prescribed fire at the base is difficult due to military mission constraints overall, extensive wild and urban interface, and sensitive areas in South Tampa, such as clinics, schools, hospitals, elderly care facilities, among many more. The base has made large strides in the past six years with the implementation of the Air Force's Civil Engineering Center's Wild and Fire Branch which has placed a traveling module at Avon Park Air Force Range that oversees prescribed fire not only at McDill, but also Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, Homestead Air Reserve Base, and Avon Park Air Force Range. So everybody likes pictures of prescribed fire. So here are a few from firms conducted over the last uh, year and a half to two years. The picture in the upper right was conducted directly adjacent to the base's airfield that where that picture was taken was standing on the south ramp. The picture in the uh, left and bottom right were conducted on the north side of the runway, uh, very close to the air traffic control center. And both of these burns were conducted in current and potential gopher tortoise habitat. So the midterm conservation goal is to fully implement the MacDill Ecosystem Restoration Plan within the next five to 25 years to restore that historic hydrology, help remove invasive plant species, and allow for implementation of natural resource management at a larger scale. 25 individual projects were designed in 2007 with several of these projects already having been completed. The plan covers over a thousand acres overall and is estimated to need more than $10 million in cumulative funding to complete. This project covers one of the largest continuous areas of forested land within the Inner Bay Peninsula and could help restore habitat utilized by small tooth sawfish, Florida manatee, wood stork, eastern indigo snake, and gopher tortoise. So the long-term goal at MacDill is to maintain and increase the population of gopher tortoise on base. This aerial image shows the sub-colonies at MacDill Air Force Base that are separated by both natural and man-made barriers. Some of those natural barriers include overgrown forests that are potentially impeding the movement of tortoise to other areas of habitat, and the man-made barriers are roads, fences, gates, buildings, and a series of large deep ditches throughout the base. This goal fits hand in glove with the base's short-term goal of implementing a more robust and historic fire regime. 
This picture shows the sign of potential recruitment and reproduction of gopher tortoise on base. This young gopher tortoise was captured on film in September of 2019 on base. Though there have not been any studies conducted at McDill regarding the recruitment or reproductive status of the gopher tortoise population. And the last population estimate in 2019 listed it at approximately 130 individuals. The past, present, and future natural resource work in McDill would not be possible only by the Air Force and service staff. And the partners on this list provide invaluable assistance and guidance for the base's natural resource program. Highlights include both services, that's the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the NOAA National Marine Fishery Service and Tampa Bay Watch, who have been integral to the construction of a living shoreline project along the southern and eastern portions of the base. The Hillsborough EPC, SWIFMA, and the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers provide invaluable assistance with permits and technical knowledge when applicable. The Tampa Bay Estuary Program provides technical assistance through journal articles, technical papers, workshops, and meetings. So on this last slide, I'm going to discuss the, some of the natural resource issues that pose risk to the military mission and species on base. There are always natural resource management issues on the horizon, as with any piece of conservation land. On the top left is the tricolored bat, which is a potential candidate species for federal listing on the Endangered Species Act, and the proposed federal listing of the eastern black rail in the upper right. Both of these pose additional natural resource management needs at McDill. Additional regulatory conservation needs, consultation needs, excuse me, under the Endangered Species Act might be needed if the potential listing of the above species goes through. Both of these species have potential habitat at McDill, and the tricolor bat has been confirmed on base through acoustic monitoring projects. McDill Air Force Base already factors the impacts to gopher tortoise into its consulta consultations with the service, even though the eastern population is a candidate species and not officially on the endangered species list, but might be in the future. The following images are going to be taken from the NOAA Sea Level Rise Viewer and show a projected one, two, and three foot rise in sea level. This photo here is of the uh, mean higher high water mark. And the light blue areas that you see are going to be new areas continually inundated by seawater. And the green shapes are low lying areas that have an increased risk of flooding. So we can see even a potential one foot increase in sea level rise will have impacts to the installation by inundating several areas of recreational opportunities and some military infrastructure, as we can see here in the southern and southeastern portion of the base. A potential two foot rise in sea level will start to show impacts to the airfield and runway at McDill itself. And we can see that on the western portion here of the runway and airfield. And a potential three foot rise in sea level would start to pose severe impacts to almost all areas of the base. We can see that in the housing area and at Bayshore Gate, and again on the runway and airfield. The Air Force and the Department of Defense overall are well aware of the potential impacts from climate change to natural resource and military infrastructure, and it is involved in their planning decision making. Climate change is also factored into several different U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service decision-making processes as well, including the listing determinations for potential species on the threatened and endangered species list. So that's all I have. Um, it ends kind of abruptly. I apologize for that. Um, so my contact information is listed here. Go Bolts. And if you have uh, any questions, please feel free to ask. Well, thank you very much for that um, presentation, Mr. Myers. Um, I find it enchanting to think of these um, pockets of natural wildlife habitat being preserved right in uh, the downtown Tampa area um, in within a military installation. Um, and um, I'm very impressed by the lengths that uh, the military and the government are both uh, going to 
to um, to preserve th these uh, wildlife species, especially the ones that are um, facing threatened designations. Um, you know, I'm in, I'm interested in that um, gopher tortoise project. It's it's interesting to hear um, that. You've got 130-ish tortoises uh, preserved in this small space, but it's unconnected to any other habitat. We're always, of course, looking for connections and wildlife corridors, but these are isolated. And then even within the base, they're isolated into sub, uh, sub areas. Um, can you speak just a moment to the to the value of preserving even isolated populations and and the long term uh, projections? How, I mean, do you expect this to be able to to be maintained, or or do you expect it, it to dwindle uh, over time because the population is isolated? Um, so, to the last portion of your question. Um, I'm not going to speak with any certainty or or um, concreteness with that. Um, I myself am not a gopher tortoise biologist, um, but it, it it has recently been not determined, but put out through several journal articles and scientific papers that approximately 250 individuals is what's known as a minimum viable population or MVP. Now that is um, under debate as is most things with science, um, especially newer information as it comes along. Um, and the importance of these gopher tortoises to McDill is, um, you know, I, I'm unaware if you're, you're you know, uh, if you know about keystone species, which the gopher tortoise is sort of the, the poster child for keystone species, where if you manage this one species, you're managing not only that species, but also for several, in this case, 100 other species as well, just from the protection and rehabilitation and restoration of the habitat that they, that they inhabit, especially here in Florida. Other military installations in Florida, um, of course, have gopher tortoise, um, but they have much more recent confirmed sightings of eastern indigo snakes, and uh, Florida scrub jays and red cockaded woodpeckers, which all all fall into the same keystone species aspect, um, which is why it's 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 good to put energy into those species because it then filters down to many other species. So I, I hope that answered your question. Very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, that's a that's a excellent point. That keystone connection and. Um, I have been amazed at the life that is in Tampa Bay since I was a child fishing uh, seahorses up out of uh, Tampa Bay, along with tiny cowfish and and uh, blowfish and pipefish uh, that would float uh, in with the seagrasses um, into this right into urban South Tampa seawalls, you know, and. Um, uh, I also am, am thinking of a photograph I saw by EPC's own Tom Ash some years ago when we worked together on a, a project, and he had a, a had taken a photo of a nudibranch um, out in our bay. There's this some amazing species among us, and and I see a a large value in preserving those as much as we can, even in isolated. Uh, pockets as long as we can for that um, for the uh, life enhancing uh, experience that they that they lend to our communities. So right. thank you very much for your work. I see uh, Commissioner Kemp, you are recognized. Thank you. I'm so um, pleased to have this. <laughs> Wonderful biology lesson this morning, which uh, I didn't quite anticipate, and uh, it's, it, that was very interesting. I did not uh, was not familiar with the term keystone species, so uh, that was great. Great little education uh, for me, or maybe a big education actually. That was very interesting. The questions. Um, so I 
was taken. I, I, I know that the military um, throughout the country have been leaders in uh, uh, starting to address climate change and look at climate change issues um, and have known that McDill, of course, was very low lying. Uh, the it was interesting that it does abruptly end as first there's one foot of sea level, two feet of sea level, and then three feet of sea level. And uh, then that's the end of the presentation. So <laughs> I am very, very uh, curious what, um, as we move for forward, do we have anticipated um, dates for this kind of uh, inundation and, uh, what it will be the response or possible uh, responses and uh, as to how we can um, preserve uh, McDill. Um, so I'm in a, in a slightly tricky position with that question. Um, <laughs> I, I am a, a U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service employee, so I can I cannot speak to to what the base is going to decide to do. The base uh, and the Air Force and the Department of Defense as a whole factor in climate change um, into their decision-making processes, not only in natural resource management, but also cultural and their National Environmental Protection Act uh, decision-making policy and several other different aspects. And they have been doing that now for several decades, actually. Um, it goes back to prior to, to the year 2000. I am I am hesitant to put any sort of timeline on it um, because there are a myriad of models and, a, and new information is coming in all the time. Um, I will say that it is good that the base is aware of it and knows about it and is and it is factored into their planning um, as well. Um, in terms of the natural resource management side of it, um, it, it, from the services side, it starts to fall into how do you, how do you just mitigate for it? Because it, it, it's coming, it's just don't know the certain degree to it, don't know the certain timeline for it, so, so you mitigate for that. Um, and that's different at every Air Force installation. Um, not only in Florida, but throughout the country as well. You know, other installations that don't deal with sea level rise, but deal with a dramatic increase in precipitation or, or huge fluxes in temperature changes or, or um, violent storms like we saw this, this summer that came through Iowa um, and decimated some, some large areas of land, of agricultural land out there. Um, so the base does deal with it. I, I help them in that decision-making process on the service side of things. Um, so that's, it, it's a tricky question to, to be asked. It, you'll, I appreciate you'll have you asking to, it. You'll <laughs> have to forgive me. As I was looking through this, I kind of forgot that you were presenting the fish from the Fish and Wildlife <laughs> Service. I was just, uh, you know, thinking purely McDill when I asked. So so uh, thanks for giving the information you could give with regards to that. It was uh, fascinating. Maybe at some point we can um, have someone from McDill who could uh, come and kind of let us or have whatever information they have with regards to that. But this was a fascinating presentation. I was going to say, who knew? <laughs> um, <laughs> was going to be my initial response uh, that, you know, that we had all these, I didn't even realize the acreage. I think you said at the beginning, 1,500 acres of uh, the um, uh, land, this, the um, kind of wildlife or uh, go for tortoise habitat land uh, those kinds of things uh, and and even the runway a thousand acres that's that's really uh you know you know it's that uh, big piece of land a peninsula down there in South Tampa but I never thought of it in terms of that uh, massive amount of acreage so this was very good thank you very much thank you I appreciate it and we have a question from Commissioner Overman you're recognized. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Myers, for pro providing us with uh, a great, great amount of information. Um, I 
being the liaison to McDill, have toured the, the base several times, had an opportunity to understand some of its concerns. And as you said earlier, while our uh, sea level rise is a big issue, um, on the base side, the encroachment is also, I think, one of the biggest issues that the base is concerned about. Um, just from the base operations side rather than fish and wildlife side. But, but it does may matter when it comes to environmental impact of, um, of the base itself on the neighborhoods that are encroaching and what needs to be placed there. So planning the growth and the placement of buildings long term does fall into a great relationship that I'm glad you have you know, with the base and the planning of the base in terms of where structures go and how they could be post potentially pay spaced or placed um, in a way that doesn't interfere with the environmental and the wildlife that is natural to the habitat of the base. Um, as a um, alumni of Maryland University and my, uh, my uh, mascot is a terrapin, I am a big fan of gophers, so turtles, and um, I'm glad to see that, that you have a good population there. It is concerning about the isolation of them, however. And um, given their average life expectancies around 40 years or so, um, is there a plan for introducing um, outside of its isolation population? Um, I, there are, I live in the middle of Tampa, and believe it or not, there's you know, next door neonus says, hi, there's a gopher turtle going down the street. Somebody needs to come find it. Um, you know, uh, frequently along the river, th there are gopher turtle sightings or tortoise sightings. And obviously, you know, up in the wetlands, up in the northwest corner of our county. So I, has there been a consideration of making sure that there is a diversity of, of uh, genetics for that isolated uh, population on the base in order to keep it healthy and strong? So that's a, that's a great question. Um, and so, yes, the, the, the big concern when you're below that minimum viable population is genetic bottlenecking that, that shows these recessive genes and, and um, sterility and some other issues that they have. Um, Boyd Hill Nature Preserve in St. Pete is dealing with a very similar issue that, that uh, McDill is dealing with as well, a population below the MVP, minimum viable population size. Um, there have been uh, meetings between uh, the service, um, the base, and Boyd Hill um, regarding that. There is a um, professor out of Ecker College that is uh, very interested in that, and he's working with uh, Egmont Key, uh, which is overseen by the service. Um, to potentially look at some some areas of interest that might might help the base. Um, the reason I ask the question is that frequently when a development has been approved in you know Hillsborough County and other counties, um, there is an environmental um, survey of wildlife in an area, and when gopher turtle tortoises are found. You know, the developers cringe and environmentalists do too, and the wildlife folks do too. And that may be a source of productive mitigation to relocate those very healthy tortoises that happen to be in an unfortunate place that might cause them, you know, to be put at risk. But given right. the development has been approved and give that as an opportunity to relocate and regenerate the, 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 uh, tribe of tourist tortoises that you have in your area. Um, right. Yeah, so, so um, to sort of tag on to that, um, sort of flipping it in the opposite direction, uh, not bringing tortoises to McDill, but um, Eglin Air Force Base in the Panhandle, which is over 450,000 acres, um, and then shares a border with uh, Herbert Field as well, is actually um, designated as the Air Force's um, go for tortoise recipient site. Um, and they are in the process or have just gotten approval for the uh, recip uh, recipient to be uh, several thousand uh, tortoise um, from around the Southeast. 
So that that is a avenue that the base could take if uh, decided upon. Um, but it, to dig down more on your question, there there hasn't been anything concrete um, about bringing more tortoise on, and the base during their planning uh, factors very heavily um, how the how construction and development will. Um, impact the natural areas and by extension gopher tortoise and potentially eastern indigo snake um, in that. Um, so it, it is factored in there. It is it is factored in there. There have been small discussions about it. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much for your presentation. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, just a quick question um, that uh, was brought to mind by Commissioner Oberman's comments. Um, I know we have terrapins in uh, Cockroach Bay area of Tampa Bay. Do you have terrapins up there around McDill in the, in the bay? I have no data that can confirm that. I, I will leave it at that. <laughs> All right. I have no data that can confirm that. Um, yes. So the base does do a an overall threatened and endangered species wildlife survey every five years, um, but they have not been seen during those surveys. Um, and I personally have not seen them, and I, I haven't seen the data that shows that they are on base. Um, I, I, oh, there we go. <laughs> I was going to say, I think you're on mute. I think you're on mute. <laughs> there you yeah, go. There we go. Such is our life nowadays. Uh, <laughs> thank you again. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. And that takes us to our next presentation. Ms. Doherty, will you introduce this? <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner. And before Brian's uh, uh, Brendan Meyer steps off, I just wanted to thank him personally. I met him a year ago. Um, that was a great presentation. The astronomical numbers, he mentioned 450,000 acres at uh, Eglin Air Force Base, but uh, I'll get that number for our next meeting of all the state install, uh, installations. There, it's phenomenal the amount of acreage that is under Air Force purview and conservation. Um, so, and we could give a whole separate presentation just on the living shoreline, that uh, restoration project that occurred there at McDill Air Force Base. But with that, I'm going to thank Brandon. Um, he, uh, we met a year ago and uh, he has a new bundle of joy that turns one year tomorrow. So thank you, thank you, Brandon. And with that, I'll turn it over to Hushang Bustani. Uh, thank you. I also want to thank Brandon and Todd for the report. I do want to give a special recognition to the coordinator for the Restoration Advisory Board, Tish Matty, and her assistant, uh, Chrissy Snyder. Without their help, it would be difficult for us to bring you this report, so thank you. Our next presentation is a general overview of the PrEP Brownfield program statewide with emphasis on an annual report that DEP submits to the legislature. Plus five Hillsborough County sites that are included in the report. So Allison Amram, who is EPC's Brownfields coordinator for the last five years, will be making a presentation. Allison has a master's degree in geology from University of West Virginia. She's also a registered professional geologist in Florida. We've had her with us five years and we could not be happier with her contributions. So with that, Allison. Thank you, Hushang. I'm going to share the presentation now. So let me know if you see it. There you are. There we go. Okay, all set. All right, well, thank you very much, Hushang, and good morning, commissioners. My name is Allison Amram. I'm a geologist, as Hushang said, with EPC, and I coordinate the EPC's Brownfield program in Hillsborough County. The Brownfield program provides incentives for cleaning up and redeveloping contaminated properties and involves all layers of environmental agencies. 
The US EPA manages grant-based programs that serve underserved communities to assess contaminated sites. Florida's program is a little bit different, and it provides incentives for the redevelopment and cleanup of contaminated properties. EPC has managed Florida's brownfield program in Hillsborough County since 2004 under a delegation agreement with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. Today, I want to present to you the state of Florida's annual brownfield redevelopment report, which summarizes activities across the state and also features projects that have been completed in the past year. Hillsborough County has five sites featured as brownfield success stories in the report, and these sites reflect the positive impacts of the brownfield program in our community. I want to show you these sites today, but first we're going to have a short two-slide brownfield 101 refresher. So what is the Florida Brownfields program? It's the incentive-based program for redevelopment of potentially contaminated properties. Contaminated land has a lower price to purchase, but there's a large unknown cost for both time and money to address the contamination, and the Brownfield program provides incentives to overcome this hurdle. To get into the Brownfields program, there are two requirements. The first is that the current owner did not cause the contamination. There's no incentive for cleaning up your own contamination. If, and the second requirement is that the property has to be contaminated, or at least have the perception that it's contaminated. So if you were purchasing a property that had a gas station or other past use that would likely impact the environment, you would want to look into it. That's the perception of contamination. The incentives that are offered in the Brownfields program are financial incentives, mostly in the form of tax credits from the state, but there's also a job creation bonus. There's also limited liability protection that's provided in the Florida statute. The Brownfields program has two goals, to clean up the site and to redevelop it. And so sometimes they go along two different paths, but they have to account for each path as they move along. There are a couple terms that we need to talk about, and they're very similar, but they provide significance to those two areas of the program. The brownfield area is the economic designation, the economic term. And in Hillsborough County, if a property owner wants to designate a, a brownfield area, they apply to Hillsborough County Economic Development. They review the proposed redevelopment plan to make sure that it's in line with what the county would like to see in that area. And they call EPC, and we review the environmental property impacts that might be there or if there are any environmental reports. This economic designation is set by a, lo a local government resolution, and this is something that you all did last week after a series of public meetings for the property, for the area designation, the local government passes a resolution and this tells a property in that area or a developer that's interested in the area that this area has been prioritized for redevelopment by the county. The brownfield site is what we call the contaminated cleanup site. And this happens when a property inside the brownfield area, it can be the entire brownfield area or it could be multiple separate properties, signs a cleanup agreement that says, yes, we will clean up the contamination that we did not cause on this property and we will do it through the state of Florida's contaminated site cleanup rules. And the bulk of what EPC does is managing the, the cleanup of these contaminated sites. Once there's a brownfield site in a brownfield area, then these incentives are available to help offset the cost of addressing the contamination. The DEP's report for the Brownfields Redevelopment Program to the legislature and to the governor's office summarizes all the information on the Brownfields program across the state. This report is based on information that's in their DEP's database. So as part of EPC's delegation, we upload all of our brownfield information onto the state's database so that all the brownfield data is accessible in one place. The DEP's report in turn can help with planning for the next fiscal year. So we're gonna first look at the summary statistics uh, from this report, and then we're gonna look at the five sites that are featured as um, brownfield success stories. And you'll hear terms like the site is closed or completed, and that means that the environmental investigation is completed. So there's completed, and then there's redeveloped, the economic and the, and the cleanup. The five sites in Florida are the Medicina property in Ruskin, the Hudson Nursery, the former Hudson Nursery on Northdale Mabry, the former Tampa High Lie in South Tampa, the Madison Street Park 
in downtown Tampa and the Gradot Amer Steel property in Orient Park. Hillsborough County has 67 of the state's 387 sites. That's more than any other county in Florida. And all total, it's about 17% of the brownfield sites in Florida. One of the things you can see from the summary statistics is that Hillsborough County has the same amount of brownfield sites coming in as they have statewide completion or cleanup orders going out. So that's a really good metric to see that we are able, we're keeping up with closing sites. Um, another nice thing I like about this report is it summarizes the incentive use in Florida and the projected capital investment is provided by the Department of Economic Opportunity. And they projected that in 2019, these brownfield sites in Florida contributed $527 million into the capital investment. The Department of Revenue tracks new and direct and indirect jobs. And in 2019, they projected that almost 1,400 jobs were created by brownfield properties. The voluntary cleanup tax credit is a tax credit that's issued on your Florida corporate income tax. And it is, you, you make an application to the Florida Department of Environmental Protection for your annual cleanup costs that you've spent in a fiscal, in a, in a calendar year. And then there is money that is provided by the tax cleanup statute that prefer, provides recurring funding. It was 5 million and then in 2017, it was increased to $10 million. But you can see here that in 2019, the Florida DEP approved $12.5 million of tax credits. Um, this is more than the 10 million that's allotted in the recurring funds. So that means that once you get your tax credit application approved, you may wait a year or sometimes even two to get your tax credit certificate. And periodically the legislature has authorized additional funds to reduce this backlog. And that leads me into the group that helps reduce that backlog, and that's the Florida Brownfields Association. They are a professional organization that's dedicated to promoting the use and the benefits of the Florida Brownfield Program. They have multiple very active communities, committees in the community, and uh, they provide education and outreach to real estate and developers on what the Brownfields Program is. They promote environmental justice issues with conventions and meetings around the state and help with uh, some of the EPA Brownfield grant applications. They also have a technical committee that works with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection to improve the site cleanup process. And they also have a legal committee that works to implement legislative changes and also work at getting additional funding for this voluntary cleanup tax credit. EPC is a member of the Florida Brownfields and we participate on the technical committee. Um, but the, by large, the biggest thing, the biggest drive to get a project into the Brownfields program to clean up a site is this cleanup tax credit. And so that's very key to getting the program to build. And uh, the Florida Brownfields Association just, they hire lobbyists and they're the ones who are responsible for increasing this tax credit funding periodically. So they do a lot of great work in Florida. So now we get to move on to the Brownfield success stories. And I'm sure this photo is familiar to you all. This is the former Tampa Armature site on the Hillsborough River, just north of downtown. And this was redeveloped a few years ago under the Brownfields program. And they also cleaned up their site too. The first site is the Medicina Brownfield site. This is 49 acres in Ruskin, and the site was used for commercial fish culture for 50 years. The site was assessed, but there were no impacts found. So this is a first for me. And construction is underway now for two new medical manufacturing buildings with future plans for a daycare and a plant nursery. This is going to create 100 jobs in Ruskin. The former Hudson Nursery is, was 10 acres along Northdale Mabry. This was a landmark on Northdale Mabry for 40 years. And environmental impacts from pesticide use were cleaned up. And then the property was broken into four commercial lots along Northdale Mabry. And these were created into different um, restaurants. There were three parcels that created into restaurants and one that is a strip center that has an eye 
Glass World retail store. And these redevelopments are, were estimated to create 100, approximately 100 full-time and 150 part-time jobs. And the former Tampa High Life site is 13 acres in South Tampa, south of Gandy. And before this site was the Tampa High Lie, it was used as a solid waste disposal area. Recently, the solid waste was removed from the site and the area was redeveloped safely as a multifamily housing development uh, with 300 apartments and townhomes. And it is estimated that this new development will create six new property management and maintenance jobs. The Madison Street Park is a narrow, slightly less than an acre of land uh, along Madison Street Park. It's in downtown Tampa, and this park this was formerly used as part of a rail line, and it, there were also petroleum equipment repair businesses. Um, the city of Tampa has been trying to increase the amount of open space and parks for the people who live downtown. There, you can see a high rise in the, in the back here, um, but they just they created a new park. They removed the soils, they cleaned it up, and they created both large and small dog park area. And they have a, uh, a recreational area for people too. There's a playground and multi-use courts, open lawn, shade pavilions. So this is really a nice improvement in the quality of life to have to live in a, in a high rise, but still have the open space that's very close and accessible for you and your pets. The Gerdeau Ameristeel property is approximately 30 acres in Orient Park, and this brownfield site has been managed by the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. This site was formerly a steel mill, which stopped operations in 1997, and the environmental cleanup began as an enforcement action with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection. They went into the Brownfields program in 2006 when a new owner took control of the property and the site contamination is now managed and the area is being divided into multiple parcels for redevelopment. As you can see, some of these parcels are for sale and uh, some lots, lots are developed and some are advertised for uh, someone to come and, and redevelop the property. One of the things I like to show you periodically is the impact on property values from the start of the brownfield site cleanup to the current day to show you the value of the land after redevelopment. The Madison Street Park has increased in property value uh, approximately half a million dollars. The Medicina property went from being former fish farms to a manufacturing facility. It's under construction, so I would expect that this million dollar addition would go up once it becomes operational. The Hudson Nursery properties, properties have gone up approximately $4 million, and the South Tampa High Lie was formerly just a vacant piece of land, and now they have the 300 homes, and that's gone up more than $35 million. The Gradeau Maristil properties are currently valued at about $4 million, but as it redevelops, we expect that property value to increase as well. These five sites have a really nice spread of how successful all over Hillsborough County the Brownfields program has been with creating 100 jobs in Ruskin to new homes near the Air Force Base, providing recreation and open space for people who live in densely populated areas like downtown, and then new commercial services along Dale Mabry, and more jobs and new industry are being proposed for the Gerdeau Mirror Steel. I like to think of the Brownfields program as a land recycling program. You clean up your existing contamination and then you can repurpose the land for better use. And this type of infill development allows the continuing use of the existing infrastructure, such as our rail lines and uh, transportation corridors. And that also helps preserve our open lands. And as we've seen in some of these sites, they, they serve as a catalyst for redevelopment in the surrounding neighborhood. As you take a vacant spot and you put apartments, then that stimulates growth in that area for other services that those people need. I wanna talk a little bit now about how EPC partners with local nonprofits. Um, a nonprofit and also lo local governments can apply for EPA Brownfield grants. And the University Area Community Development Center recently won a 300,000 
EPA Brownfield grant. This builds on a previous EPA grant that was awarded to this organization and in partnership with USF, and that looked at potentially contaminated properties in this university area, community area. This multi-purpose grant will be used for assessing sites at multiple properties, and EPC provides letters of support for the grant application, and then we assist with any technical direction they need for contaminated sites, as well as permitting assistance with wetland issues. And the USF also partnered with the Corporation to Develop Communities of Tampa for a $200,000 EPA grant. This is not an EPA, this is not a Brownfield grant, but EPC became involved with this due to our past partnership with USF and the Brownfields program. This is an environmental workforce development and job training grant, and it was one of two that were awarded in Florida last year. EPC supports this grant by assisting with the environmental training needs in our community, and we're also planning a post-COVID open house at EPC so that the trainees from the job training program can see an environmental workplace and have an opportunity to discuss the industry with EPC employees. We're looking forward to that day. And just to summarize what's gone on with EPC in the last year, we have five sites that are completing their environmental investigations. Two of them are at the port at Hooker's Point, one is, two are in Tampa's downtown area, and one is in Plant City. We also have two new sites that were just approved last week by you all in your role as county, county commissioners as Brownfield areas. The first is the Colonnade Crosstown, or some people know it as the Project Bessie site. It's 158 acres along US 301 and Causeway Boulevard, and that will provide a headquarter home for Coke, Florida, and there'll be several commercial out parcels there, and it's estimated to be to create 182 new jobs. You also approved a brownfield area for American 17, and they are redeveloping 10 and a half acres along South 50th Street as a class three solid waste recycling and transfer facility, and also an auto recycling facility that will create 27 new jobs. We have three to five new sites coming soon, um, as development goes, things move really fast and then they slow down and you never quite know when they're actually going to happen. But we have uh, serious inquiry and brownfield app area applications going on and draft BISRAs with, with several new sites. And so we're looking forward to bringing new programs in as we're getting some of the old programs closed out too, some of the old sites. So I know we covered a lot, but if you would like to learn more about the Brownfields program, Please, please give me a call. And uh, these photos are, this is a close up of, of the Cortona apartments. And this is the plaque at the Madison Street Park. So I'm happy to take any questions you might have at this time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, board members, do you have any questions or comments? Um, I, I have a quick question. Um, what was the pollution that needed cleaning up at the High Life Ronton? They had solid waste disposed there. So they they pulled all the solid waste out and they brought in clean fill to, to construct the property. And that right now they're monitoring the groundwater to see what the impacts were. Because you couldn't really tell, you know, you, you got an indication of what was there when it, all the waste was there, but once you remove that, things improve. And so they're in a phase now where they're watching the groundwater to see things improve, but they're all hooked up to city water and no one uses the groundwater on that parcel. There's a restriction on that. Thank you. Um, it's a very timely presentation. I'm glad we got this today because we've had, as you say, uh, a couple of these on our last um, county commission agenda. And we had a couple more, it seems to me, just uh, a few weeks ago. Um, and then, as you noted, we have some uh, in the pipeline uh, to come to us uh, fairly soon. So it's really great to understand this. And um, I was, as I as I went over this agenda, was just learning that um, Hillsborough County has 60? Um, 67. 67 brownfield sites, um, the most of any county in, in Florida? Yes. yes. It's coming up soon. 
<laughs> we <laughs> are 59. We're very, very lucky in our county to have such close um, monitoring and and uh, ability to to figure out you know which sites are appropriate and which sites um, and exactly how to take them through this process by having our own environmental protection commission here to um, to really assure us that the uh, mitigation is being done properly and and uh, in a in a way that benefits our our county um, and also to have our own EDC uh, economic development um, department that um, that vets the sites in the first place and make sure that these um, projects are going to be what our county wants in these spots. So I am. Um, I think we have a, a, a very good, well-oiled machine to be able to get the most out of this program. I do see a couple of other commissioners within the queue. Uh, Commissioner Overman, you're recognized. Thank you. Um, Allison, thank you very, very much for your report. Um, as, as the chair of Affordable Housing Advisory Board, and then we have a, a, a dire need for affordable housing, one of the barriers is the capital stack necessary to get that financing done. Um, and as we look at the way we infill and develop along our transit corridors, what I've noticed in your presentation is that along our rail lines or in those areas where industry previously thrived, but um, we have um, some blighted areas in the center of the city as a consequence of some different types of industries. Um, I, I'm thinking of Florida Avenue where there's, you know, the car lot lane forever. Um, there's the, having these programs and having the Brownfield program and the tax credits available are critical to our long, short and long-term goals for economic redevelopment of urban areas that are impacted by brownfields. And so I am thrilled to see that, not that we have that many areas, but, but the thrilled to see that the brownfield program and the tax credit program um, can not only be tapped, but also that there are, are partnerships with our nonprofits and uh, financing agencies to help finance those tax credits when there is a delay in the funding. So there's lots of tools available to help redevelop these areas that are ripe for redevelopment. And it's so critically important that those areas are identified in order to make sure that if we are building affordable housing, we're building it on safe soil where kids will play and areas are our recreation as well as you know buildings being built on them that might cause a problem long term so thank you very much for this presentation and the program so that all of our commissioners have a clear understanding of how valuable this program is and how important it is to our long-term um, growth plans so thank you very much for the presentation well, thank you very much for your comment. One of the, that brings one thing to mind that I didn't mention, and that is there are tax credits for affordable housing if they are adjacent to a brownfield site, because you can't build affordable housing over any property that's contaminated, but if it is adjacent to a contaminated site that's being cleaned up, then there are tax credits. Um, it, they come as a tax refund on your sales, your, your building materials sales tax gets refunded. So it's one of the things that's offered. Just make Thank it you. a bit sweeter. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's really good to know. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Kemp, you're recognized. Thank you. Great presentation. Good to learn so much. Um, I was curious. I know that you said it was a, a the high lie was a, a solid waste site, but um, what about um, Hudson Nursery at, as well as the Pebble Creek Golf Course? The Hudson Nursery was, a, you know, they operated as a plant nursery, so they used pesticides to keep the them from, you know, attacking the plants. And they had um, they had some other um, like machine shop, you know, some petroleum car compounds that were found. So that was the contamination there, and they they managed their soils. 
and they monitored the groundwater and they had one area that had some groundwater contamination, but it was just in one well, it wasn't moving. So they've restricted the groundwater in that area. Um, the other site was, you said Hudson and- Pebble Creek Golf Course. Pebble Creek Golf Course. I haven't seen much on the Pebble Creek Golf Course yet. They're applying for brownfield area. Um, they have, we've had discussions, they have contamination also from uh, pesticide use and the, the pesticides generally show arsenic contamination and some of the pesticides that are like dieldrin and some others. Um, but th they are coming in saying that they manage the golf course at a time after those pesticides were, were not allowed to be used. And they're providing legal affidavits saying that we did not use this product. We've owned and operated this course at this point. And um, I believe their, um, their golf course is not doing very well. And so they want to redevelop it as something else that will put that land to better use instead of just running the business down. But that's, a, that's an upcoming project that we'll be looking at. That, the reason I ask is because so many golf courses, and I thought you were going to say with Hudson Nursery, you know, I wondered if it was the uh, pesticides and chemicals that were used. And with golf courses um, transitioning in many places, I, that's why I was curious um, as to that. Uh, another um, curiosity I have uh, is uh, with regards to uh, gas stations, because I can see a future in a few decades where um, I hope that our gas stations will all be disappearing and will be 100% electric. So I was wondering about our gas station sites. Are Is it standard? Because you said also the perception of pollution as well as pollution. I know that often there is a leaky tank or some um, gas or oil contamination. Will that be that every site has that or how, how, how what would we should expect with those sites? I'm just curious. So you're asking about how we will be able to manage redevelopment at gas station sites? Yeah, are they typically, okay. um, do they typically fall into brown fields just almost automatically or? Not in Florida. Right now there is a Florida brown fields, uh, there is a the petroleum cleanup programs and Hushang knows a whole lot more about this. So step in if you- I see him coming Hushang. on. <laughs> yes, I know. So uh, I don't deal with the petroleum because there is a good program that helps, uh, helps fund the discharges and controlling that contamination through another program in Florida. So if they're petroleum only, they don't, jump, they don't come into the brownfield program. Um, Hushang, did you wanna say more? Yes, please. Commissioner, we have a program known as the Petroleum Cleanup Program. It's under contract with DEP. <clears throat> the, the legislature has set aside, established and set aside a, a, a fund dedicated to cleaning up of leaking storage tank, fuel tanks. And uh, it's been around for uh, since 1987. And we have been administering that program here in Hillsborough County since 87, uh, the, those, those contaminations are identified and assigned and they'll go through similar process to brownfields in terms of cleanup. Uh, first they're investigated and uh, then staff works with owners, contractors, consulting firms. There are about 2,500 of them. <clears throat> That's not an exact number, but it's around that that we've had identified in Hillsborough County. Wow. Close to 16 or 1700 of them have been cleaned up. But again, as anything else, you know, and, and recent facilities are very much protective of leakage because most everything in gas stations is now double lined. With, you know, with, with detective system and what have detection systems and what have you, but most of the contamination are from the days prior to the creation and promulgation of regulations. We also have another program which strictly works with these facilities to make sure that they adhere to regulations and minimize, minimizes the leakage of future contamination. So uh, that is a, that has been an effective program and uh, you know, that's uh, 
that's what happens with with uh, fuel facilities. Well, I guess we're going to have to have a uh, presentation by Mr. Bustani on that in a future time. But that was that was interesting summary. Thank you. We'll be happy to commission this. <laughs> Thank you, and um, I see no no further hands in the queue. Thank you very much, Ms. Amram, for this presentation. As you see, it's uh, been very informative for us and in, in a timely, um, at a very timely point. Thank you. Thank you very much. And this takes us to Ms. Doherty for the director's report. Thank you, Commissioner. and. Um, while uh, Ms. DeLue is loading my slides, I do want to thank uh, Hushang Bustani, Allison Amram, Brendan Myers, and all the RAB members that were on for all of their uh, support uh, for not only for the restoration at uh, McDill Air Force Base, but for the Brownfields uh, restoration as well. So thank you guys very much. You did a great job. Um, before I begin the executive director report, I did want to let um, Commissioner Overman know that I am also a Terrapin. That is the mascot for Tampa Prep too. So I love Terrapins myself. Um, and with that, I'm going to move directly into my slides here. Um, it is with great sadness that EPC has lost a dear friend, an environmental advocate. Uh, Commissioner Smith uh, was referencing him today in her opening remarks with the passing of Kent Bailey on September 22nd. He was a longtime contributing member of our environmental feedback group and SEAC. Uh, and we, he joined us for our meeting of the environmental feedback group last month. He was always willing and able to share his valuable insights into the environmental challenges faced by our, our county. He, he was also very thorough and an amazing, he would collect data and uh, give, give that data freely to not only the media, but environmental agencies as ourselves. He will be greatly missed and we offer our sincerest condolences to his family for their loss, as well as Commissioner Smith's remarks this morning. Next slide, please. The environmental and business feedback groups annual meetings are important to maintaining our two way communication with our citizenry and the regulated community. This summer, we met virtually with both groups. Our discussions were informative as we shared about our experiences in providing customer service during the state of the emergency, as well as strategizing ways we can partner together to address environmental concerns and challenges we face ahead. And this slide has is a list of um, the environmental feedback group members. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the list of the business feedback group. Um, it was well attended. I wanted to point out that one of our longtime members, Paul Carpinoni, is retiring from TECO and we wish him the best. Um, we discussed new nominations for the business feedback group but a lot of our discussions uh, for both of these program, both of these feedback groups were about legislative updates regarding environmental issues, uh, our air attainment status. A lot of them had questions about what the air quality was during the beginning months of COVID, uh, near road air monitoring site and mobile source impacts, uh, the Monroe station near I-275, uh, ELAP projects and septic tank issues and needs in South County and in areas where groundwater tables were high. Uh, Jan Smith, with, with many of you know, was very concerned about uh, contamination from septic and new housing being built on lakes in the northern end of the district of the county. Next slide, please. The Hillsborough Solar Co-op has been going strong and they have nearly reached their membership goal for the following, following the final information session last Thursday. And I was part of the second co-op and I do have solar and I highly recommend it. The co-op closes to new members on October 16th and anyone that is interested in joining may visit the website at www.solarunitedneighbors.org slash Hillsborough. Can I just? Yes. Woo -hoo, woo -hoo. <laughs> that's that's it. I'm just really thrilled. <laughs> yeah, it's great. I think that's our third one. So we've been highly successful. 
Um, the, Fl the Florida Public Service Commission, the PSC, also met on Thursday to discuss this last Thursday to discuss the state's net metering policy. Florida is one of 47 states that has a net energy metering policy that allows solar homeowners to receive a credit for electricity sent back to the grid. The PSC has received over 16,000 emails regarding this issue. It does not appear that the commission will take immediate action to initiate rulemaking, but this may be considered at a future date. As a side note, many industries create generation uh, through electric generation and sell back to the grid as well. The PSC plans to continue informally gathering information as they consider the scope of action moving forward. We anticipate holding a second workshop shop as a part of this process. The commission will accept public comments until Thursday, October 8th. We will be monitoring the commission's progress regarding this issue. And on this slide, note that you can gain information at www.psc.state.fl.us. And the docket number is 2020000. Next slide, please. EPC held a virtual meeting to celebrate the retirement of Chief Assistant County Attorney Jenny Tarr and to wish her well after a lifetime of service with Hillsborough County. Jenny set the tone for making our annual diversity and harassment prevention training sessions entertaining. She did this along with Rudy Heidermoda, who they've both been invaluable during this transition from civil service. They were informative and something for staff to look forward to each year. Jenny's wealth of knowledge and her professionalism are beyond compare, and we appreciate everything she did to support EPC over the years. She is part of our EPC family, and she will be greatly missed. Next slide, please. EPC held a drive-by baby shower to congratulate Kim Thorpe of our Waste Division and her husband, Patrick, as they prepare for the arrival of their first child, Nathan Craig Thorpe. Tonight, commissioners, I will be a guest speaker at the Tampa Bay Association for Environmental Professionals Women in STEM 2020 workshop. Uh, my presentation, uh, it actually was re a reference to a book uh, called Lean In, but it's making a STEM career by doing what you love. Uh, the workshop will feature a special message by renowned oceanographer, Dr. Sylvia Earle, who's just an amazing woman. Uh, and Deep Ocean Exploration and Research Doer, President Liz Taylor. Next slide, please. Also tonight, the general public may register to see Dr. Earle's new film, Mission Blue, which premieres online at 7 p.m. The film shows the quest to protect oceans from pollution, overfishing, and climate change. This event is free and registration is available through the SDG Action Alliance Facebook page. Next slide, please. Uh, and finally, commissioners, I will be presenting the 2020 annual report at our next scheduled commission meeting on October 15th, and that will be our last meeting for 2020. Uh, this year's theme is adapting to our new environment. And with that, that concludes my remarks, unless you have any questions. Thank you so much, Janet. Um, I don't see any questions or comments, but I just want to say um, your your present your presentations, your director's report every month show the great depth and breadth of uh, the work that our EPC covers and that you personally um, manage and, and oversee and all the extracurricular activities as well. I'm always so proud of our county um, having our own Environmental Protection Commission here and the good work that we do. Thank you so much, Commissioner. That means a lot. And um, it, that is the end of the uh, uh, reports and, and presentations and action items for today. Is there any suggestion of future agenda items that anyone wants to bring forward at this time? If not, you can always, of course, uh, contact Ms. Doherty and, and make suggestions directly. 
seeing no further discussion from the board members or staff, uh, I think we, this brings us to adjourning the meeting. Thanks, thanks, Ms. Doherty. Thanks to everyone. Thank you, commissioners. Have a great day and stay safe. See you, everybody. Thank you very much. Bye -bye.